open that one. And that one is, oh no, we're, we did that one. So we're doing number 11, and that is Revelations 1000 Years. So we'll look at that tonight. Uh, so glad to have each person tuned in. And uh, let's go ahead and start with prayer, shall we? Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we just want to ask that as we open your word together, that you would lead and guide our Bible study, uh, that you would bless us and help us as we study. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're covering the thousand years in the Bible. And the thousand years is known as the millennium. And it's mentioned only in one place in the Bible. And that is Revelation chapter 20. So we're going to be looking at that quite a bit tonight. Um, and everything that has to do with the thousand years, what's going to happen uh, during the thousand years. Before we look at that Bible study for tonight, uh, as we always do, just want to see if there are any questions that anyone has that, um, that we can cover together, either from this study or from a, another study or another Bible question that you might have. Okay, I don't see any questions. So we're going to go right into the first question for the study. And you can interrupt me at any time if you have any questions and happy to cover those uh, together with you. All right. Uh, first question in tonight's study. Yes. Was there a question there? Okay, maybe not. Okay, first question is, how did Jesus describe Satan? And let's go to John chapter 8 and verse 44. John 8 and verse 44. <clears throat> and if I could get a volunteer to read that, that would be terrific. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Yes. So what does this tell us about Satan? Well, several things. Um, evidently, Satan has children. And those who follow in his footsteps are known as his children. It says, you are of your father, the devil. And those who are the ch children of Satan, they have the same desires as, as Satan. It says, the desires of your father you want to do. So what are his desires? Well, he's a murderer from the beginning. Uh, he does not stand in the truth. He's the father of lies. There's no truth in him. So Satan is a liar, and he's been a liar from the beginning. And those who follow in his footsteps grasp onto lies. Uh, and if Satan has children, our Heavenly Father has children as well. And what do God's children look like? Well, they're just the opposite of Satan, of course. Uh, Satan is a murderer. God's children seek to preserve life. Satan does not stand in the truth. God's children hold on to the truth. Satan is a liar. God's children only speak the truth. And just as the children of the devil follow his desires, so the children of God follow his desires and his will. So there's two, two groups. Two groups. What caused, question number two, what caused Satan's fall from his high position in heaven? So we'll go to Isaiah 14, Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll go to verses 12 through 14, Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14, and it says, how you are fallen from heaven, 
O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mounts of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And those who follow Lucifer's ways have the same heart as him. Rather than ascending, or rather than uh, giving of themselves as Jesus, they want to ascend as Lucifer. They want to do as he has done. So what was it that caused Satan's fall from his high position in heaven? He is coveting of the throne of God, wanting to be the Most High. How successful will Satan ultimately be at receiving the worship of the world? Well, we only have to go over to Revelation 13 and verse 8, and we find that most of the world uh, becomes a child of Satan in the end, or children of Satan in the end. They follow him. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. And somebody, could somebody read that for us? Any volunteers? All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Great job. Great job. So how many on the earth? It says all. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb. So Satan has many people who are following him at the end of time. Uh, many, many. So he's been pretty, accept, uh, pretty successful at getting people to follow his lies. Now let's go to the fourth question. When does Satan's dom uh, domination of planet Earth come to a final end? Now, I'm looking forward to that when Satan's uh, rule will finally come to an end. And we'll, we look in Revelation 20, and now we come to the thousand years. Revelation 20 and verse 1. And it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for 1,000 years. Won't it be a day when Satan is bound never more to tempt, never more to pester, never more to cause pain and suffering? Won't it be a day when he is bound in that bottomless pit? Um, so here is when Satan's dominion comes to an end. What happens as a result of Satan being bound for 1,000 years? Well, we'll go to Revelation 20 and verse 3. It says, and, uh, says, And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So the question is, what happens as a result of Satan being bound for 1,000 years? Well, it says that uh, as a result of him being bound for the 1,000 years, uh, his deception ends. There's no one for him to deceive for 1,000 years. Now, let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Does anybody have questions over anything that we've gone over so far? Okay, so, so far we've looked at that Satan is a deceiver and a liar and his children follow him. Those are any of those who take on the, uh, the lies of Satan in their life. 
God's children are those who follow the truth and they follow God's ways. Satan's, we've covered that Satan's ways always lead to selfishness. Uh, Jesus' ways lead actually just the opposite. Jesus' ways lead to selflessness. So we're going to go over here to another verse. Uh, it's Philippians chapter 2. For some reason, my... Let's see if we can get this to work here. There we go. We'll go to Philippians chapter 2. And notice what it says about the children of God uh, in opposition to, to Satan. Notice it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he, what is that word? He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus, one who is equal to God, decided that he was going to humble himself for our sake. And he, uh, he took on human flesh. And then he became obedient to the point of death. Now, there's many deaths that a person can die, many noble deaths that a person can die. But the most despised death was the death of the cross. And Jesus chose uh, this death, the death of the cross, to save you and me and to lay out for us a path of humility that we should follow in in his footsteps. So Satan and his children, they exalt themselves. And Jesus and his children, they are willing to humble themselves in the sight of the Lord. Notice what happens as a result of humbling yourself. Uh, Philippians 2 verse 9 says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. So uh, those who follow Jesus with him will be exalted, and those who follow Satan with him will be demoted. And this is what we, where we find Satan in the thousand years. He's been demoted. He can no longer deceive. He can only, only wander on the earth for 1,000 years, uh, looking for people to tempt, but all are in their graves during this thousand years, so there's no one to tempt. What is it that begins the thousand years in Scripture? We're going to go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, to discover how the thousand years begin. All right, verse 16 and 17. Who can read these two verses for us? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Yes. So here is the first resurrection. Those who are part of this first resurrection will be caught up to, together with the living righteous, and they will ascend uh, to heaven. So if there's a first resurrection, how many resurrections are there in the Bible? So let's go and answer that question. Jesus actually answers it in John chapter 5 and verse 28. And notice what he says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice. And come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. 
and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That is the second resurrection. So the Bible actually talks about two different resurrections, and they happen at two different times. When does the first resurrection happen? And uh, where does the Bible describe the righteous as being during the millennium? So we'll go over to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 to answer this. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, and notice what it says. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So here you have all of the righteous who are living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years in heaven. Where do the righteous go once they're resurrected? They go to heaven. Uh, how long are they, are they in heaven? For 1,000 years, according to the Bible. Notice verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. I want part in the first resurrection, don't you? I want to be there in heaven with Jesus, don't you? John chapter 14 and verse... Excuse me. No worries. John chapter 14 and verse 2, said, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus' plan is to take us to heaven. And he does that at the second coming. And once we get to heaven, that is the beginning of the 1,000 years. So we can, uh, you can see a little chart in your uh, study guide there. Your study guide should show that the first resurrection uh, is the beginning of the thousand years. You, it's at the end of the last days. You have the return of Jesus. The righteous dead are raised. The living saints are caught up. The wicked are slain and Satan is bound for a thousand years. So that's what happens uh, right at the beginning of the 1,000 years. What happens during the thousand years? Well, your little chart there says, the righteous are in heaven. Praise the Lord. That's you and me. And then the wicked, they remain dead during the thousand years. That's why Satan uh, can't tempt them. Uh, he has no one to tempt, no one to deceive, because all the wicked are dead. Satan is bound by a chain of circumstance during the thousand years, and the righteous are going to judge during the thousand years. So if the righteous are in heaven during the millennium, where are the unrighteous? So we're going to look at that from Revelation chapter 6 and verse 16 and 17. Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. And who would like to volunteer to read that for us? And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the worth of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And then verse 17, can you read that one too? For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand it? Yeah, great job. All right, it says that, uh, that at the second coming of Jesus, when this is the second coming of Jesus, all of the, the people, they say, let the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him uh, who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now we're going to go over to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. Revelation 20 and verse 5. And it says, The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. 
So uh, if the righteous are in heaven during the thousand years, where are the wicked? Well, the Bible indicates that they are dead. They've called for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. They've been destroyed by the brightness of Jesus coming. And uh, let's go over to 2 Thessalonians. We're going to look at that together here. Um, here we are. Let's see if we can find it here. There it is. Notice what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Uh, the lawless ones are the ones who don't keep God's law. They don't follow in the footsteps of Jesus. They are not children of God. They are children of the devil. And at the second coming of Jesus, at his coming, those will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So they call for the mountains and rocks to fall on them and hide them from the face of Jesus. And the brightness of Jesus consumes them. So they will be, um, they will be dead during the thousand years. Uh, question number 10 in your study guide. How does the Bible describe the effect of the second coming on lost people? So we'll go to Jeremiah 25 and verse 33. And can somebody read that one for us? Jeremiah 25 and verse 33. And at the day that the slain, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Yes. This is a picture, not a pretty picture, of what will happen at the end. Uh, right there, when Jesus comes, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. What will be the condition of planet earth during the thousand years? So we go to Jeremiah 4 and verse 23. And as I turn there, are there any questions that people have so far in this study? Any questions that anyone has that have come up in your mind as we've been looking at this particular study? All right, well, let's read this together. Uh, what will be the condition of the earth during that time? And it's Jeremiah 4, 23 and 25. It says, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of heaven uh, had fled. So here we have an empty planet, a planet without life. Uh, here at the, during the thousand years. What will the righteous be doing in heaven during this thousand year period? Well, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 say that the righteous will be sitting on thrones. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. So we're going to be judging during the thousand years. There's, a, uh, there's another verse, and I don't, I don't think it's in this study, but it says that we shall even judge angels. So that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse... Uh, two and three. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? 
And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to life? So during the thousand years, we're going to have the opportunity to look at those books, those records. We're going to have the opportunity to ask questions. All of those questions that we never got answered here on earth, we can ask then. We're going to have the opportunity to see why certain people were left out of heaven and why certain people were brought into heaven. Perhaps there's somebody in heaven you never thought would make it there. Perhaps there's somebody not in heaven that you always thought would make it there. During the thousand years, we're going to get to understand why. Uh, we're going to be able to see what God saw um, during, during those thousand years. Um, Pastor Michael? Yeah, yeah. From number 11, when the earth is dark, then are all the animals are dead too, right? They must be. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I wanted to point out something interesting there in number 11. Notice that it, uh, let me pull it, pull it up again. Revelation, oh, not Revelation. It was Jeremiah 4, 23. Notice that it says, indeed, it was without form and void. Where else in the Bible have we read that the earth was without form and void? Creation. Yeah, creation. So if we go back to creation, uh, in the beginning, very first two verses, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Notice that at the, uh, during the thousand years, creation is reversed. God brings our planet back to the place where it was before he created anything. I listened to one pastor share this sermon. He said, you know, it only took God six days to create life and everything we see on our planet. Uh, every tree, all the bushes and the flowers, all the animals, the fish, the birds, human beings. Six days, God took this, this formless, void, and dark planet and made something beautiful. Now God gives Satan the planet just as he found it, without form and void, gives it into the hands of Satan and gives him a thousand years. And in 1,000 years, Satan cannot do what God did in six days. Um, there's something else that I want to point out to you, and that is this, uh, this term, I believe, without form, or maybe it's the term void. That is the same, uh, in the Septuagint, it's the same Greek word used in Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, when it talks about a bottomless pit. And I'll pull up the Greek here so you can see it. Uh, here it is, abuso. Abuso. This abuso or abyss, that is the same Greek word used in Genesis chapter 1 in the Septuagint. So we'll try and pull it open here so that you can see it. Uh, let's do Septuagint, and here it is, right here, uh, Abyssos, but it's, but it's Abuso, and uh, do they have the full, no, they don't have the full Septuagint translation, oh, there it is, here it is, right here, this word, Abuso, so the same word used for without form and void is translated in uh, Revelation as bottomless pit. So what is this bottomless pit? Well, it's not an actual pit that goes down forever and ever and ever and doesn't have a bottom. Abusos, this bottomless pit, is actually planet Earth without light, without life, 
without anything on it. It's a lifeless rock. And, uh, and that is, that is, uh, that is what earth will be during the thousand years without form and void. Yeah, before we continue, any other questions, Janet or anyone else? Okay, question number 13, what has Satan been doing during the millennium? All right, so let's go to Revelation 20 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7 says, Now when the thousand years have been expired, Satan will be released from his prison. So what has Satan been doing during the thousand years? Nothing. In Spanish, nada. He's been doing nothing. He's uh, basically been imprisoned on this dark planet. And uh, he hasn't been doing anything. So basically, he's been left with his thoughts. For 1,000 years, Satan thinks about all that he, all the havoc and ruin and pain and suffering he's caused. Um, doesn't convert him, doesn't change him, but he's, he's just there uh, thinking about these things for 1,000 years with his, his own evil angels. All right, what remarkable event takes place at the end of the thousand years? And we'll go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. And it says, The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So, and, uh, and then it says, This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Now, that's worded a little bit confusingly. Uh, the this is the first resurrection is talking about those who were resurrected and went to heaven. Uh, the rest of the dead who did not live again until the thousand years are finished, those are the wicked. Um, because it says when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. So Satan is released from his prison. Uh, the wicked dead are resurrected. As Jesus said, this is the resurrection of condemnation, remember. Uh, they are resurrected at the end of the thousand years. And Satan goes out and gather the, gathers them together. Um, their number, as the Bible says, is as the sand on the sea. There's so many of these wicked people. And he gathers them together for a great battle. Now, at the end of the thousand years, there's something else that happens. And that is in Revelation 21, verse 2. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, it says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the new Jerusalem begins to come down uh, out of heaven, prepared by God. And guess who's inside the new Jerusalem? Jesus is there. The Father is there. The Holy Spirit is there. All the angels are there. All the righteous are there. And they come down from heaven. They've been in heaven this entire time. And now at the end of the thousand years, they come down with the holy city to this earth. The wicked dead are resurrected. And what happens when the wicked dead are resurrected and the holy city comes down? We're in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. And um, who can read that one for us? And might as well read verse 9 from question 16 and 17. 
just verses 7, 8, and 9. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. To battle. Whose number is as the sand of the sea? They went up on the breadth of the earth and uh, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Yes. The devil who, okay, until nine or ten. Yeah, just there, just there. That's good. Thank right. you. Thank you, thank you. All right, so what will Satan's influence, uh, what will Satan influence the wicked to do when they are raised from the dead? He's going to influence them to battle. And so he's going to gather these men. Napoleon is going to be there. Alexander the Great is going to be there. These great men of battle will be there. And he's going to gather them together for this final battle against God and his people. And they're going to surround the city. They aren't allowed to fight against the city because before they can fight, the Bible says fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Now, what does devour mean? Well, have you ever devoured your dinner? Devour means it's completely and totally consumed. There's nothing left. So unlike many who say that uh, people will be burning forever and ever and ever, the Bible tells us that when, when the thousand years finish, the devil, his angels, and all the wicked will be devoured in fire. They will be destroyed. What does God do once this final rebellion has been put down? And we're in Revelation 21 and verse 1. Pastor Michael? Revelation, yes. In mm -hmm. Revelation 20:15, it says, Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. How does this coincide yeah. with fire coming down from heaven? So when the, when the fire comes down from heaven, it's going to turn this world into a lake of fire. Okay. Uh, so we know that from 2 Peter. So 2 Peter chapter 3 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So if you think of all the rocks melting because of the heat, uh, what do rocks turn into when they melt? Lava, lava, right? And if you've ever looked at lava, if you're trying to describe lava from the perspective of John, you look at all that lava and you're going to call it a lake of fire. And so that's what happens. And then it says, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So the fire that comes down and destroys the wicked will not only destroy the wicked, but the whole world will begin to melt and turn into a lake of fire. And it will destroy this earth. And then the fires will cool. And then out of the ashes of the old world, God will create a new world. Thank you. Y you bet. You bet. Okay. And that brings us to question number 18. What does God do once this final rebellion is put down? And we're in Revelation 21 and verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. So here God creates a new heaven and a new earth. How wonderful. A new heaven and a new earth that are joined together. Right now, we have earth here and heaven is separated from earth. Uh, but when, when God comes down here with this city, God is going to dwell with his people right here. 
uh, earth will become the new heaven and new earth. Verse 2 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. What a beautiful, uh, beautiful picture there. So God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, this is question number 19. How does the book of Revelation describe God's relationship with his people in the, new, in the earth made new? And that's found there in Revelation 21 and verse 3. It says uh, that he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. What a beautiful picture there. Now, I want to take you over to Isaiah 65 because it actually mentions the new heaven and the new earth there in Isaiah 65. Um, here it is, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Won't that be a beautiful day where uh, all, that, all that was lost will not come to mind, uh, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. All right. Um, I want to skip down to verse 21. It says, uh, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hand. Um, and then verse 25, here's the animals that God will create in the new heaven and the new earth. It says, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. I also wanted to bring you down here, the very next chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 22, it says, For as the new heavens and the new earth shall, uh, which I shall make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one, what is that, everyone? From one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. So will we continue to keep the Sabbath in the new heavens and the new earth? Absolutely. So the Sabbath remains in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, there's going to be animals in the new heaven and the new earth. We are going to be with God in the new heaven and the new earth. And finally, let's go to Revelation 21 and verse 4. And maybe we can have a volunteer read our final verse, we'll have this one be our final verse, Revelation 21 and verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So that's our great hope. That's what we're looking forward to. Um, and that will finally conclude the great controversy between Christ and Satan, the great controversy that has been waging over our souls for so many years. So that is the teaching on the thousand years, how it begins, how it ends. How many of you want to be ready for Jesus when he comes again and want to go to heaven with him, to reign with him for a thousand years? Is that your desire? And if it is, um, I pray that now is the time. Now is the time when we need to 
make our lives, uh, make sure our lives are ready for Jesus so that when he comes, uh, we can go with him to heaven. And how do we make our lives ready? By acknowledging our sins, repenting of our sins, and seeking to live in harmony with God's will and God's way. Uh, we want to be children of God, receiving Jesus as our Savior and as our coming King. All right, well, let's end our study in prayer together, and then we'll take any final questions that, uh, that there are. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for leading and guiding our study, and I pray that you would bless each and every one of us, that we might be ready on that day when you come again soon. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, any questions that anyone has that we can answer as we wrap up?